In this video, you are going to learn the four crucial steps to achieving professional lighting design for your local church. The video you're about to watch is one of the lessons from our new Lighting for Worship online course that you will find at worshipministryschool.com. We're giving this lesson away free here on YouTube, but if you'd like to access all of our courses and all of the lessons, check out worshipministryschool.com and apply to join our program today. I also want you to check out our Worship Ministry Toolkit linked below. It contains all of our gear and software recommendations for worship ministry, and we recently updated this toolkit to include our favorite gear for church lighting. Without further ado, let's dive into the lesson. In this lesson, you are going to learn about lighting theory and best practices. It is so important before you start putting together a lighting system and using control software that you understand the foundations of lighting theory. You guys know we are big on this. If you've taken any of our other courses in worship ministry school, like our audio courses, it's all about getting the fundamentals right before you try to get all fancy, because that's not going to end up well for you if you skip the fundamentals. So that's what this lesson is all about. Let's talk about lighting objectives for the local church. What is the purpose of a lighting system in the context of a worship gathering, both in-person gatherings and online gatherings. There's really two objectives in my opinion. Number one, illuminate subjects. Make sure you have adequate light so the congregation can see the pastors, worship leaders, uh, the rest of the congregation maybe, and any other people or objects that they need to see in worship and the things that they, they need to see that's going to support what's being communicated throughout the service or what you're trying to uh, convey to your congregation or have them experience uh, during the worship service. And you can get really creative with this, but you know, simply put, make sure people can see your pastor and the worship leaders and the people on the platform who are communicating or leading a song or sharing announcements or leading communion or leading a baptism. You want people to see people getting baptized, right? Uh, we have a sense of sight that God has given us and we use that sense of sight in the worship gathering. And the most foundational way we do that is through just simply illuminating subjects. The second objective, which is a bit fancier, and this will be contextualized to your local church setting, is creative design. It's the ability to enhance and support the message in various moments during the worship experience. And usually we do this through color and special atmospheric effects. The lighting design world can get as complex and creative as you and your church want it to be. Um, and that is a pretty important objective of our lighting system. We wanna be able to support the emotion and dynamics of the songs that we're singing. Because again, it's just engaging another sense that we have as human beings uh, to speak the truths of the gospel, whether that's through songs or through preaching or, or whatever it is. Maybe it's just the environment of the room, the way we have the lighting and the aesthetic of the room and the stage, that that speaks to people's hearts, even though it's not in an overt, you know, verbal way. Uh, it's kind of more in a sub subliminal way, right? So um, the way you light your church says a lot about what you your church believes and what your church believes about God. Um, and we can get more into the nuance of, of some of that design theory later on in the course. But um, simply put, creative design can be Let's throw some color in there. Again, because color is a simple way to enhance or emphasize the emotional theme of whatever it is you're trying to sing or communicate. So let's throw some color. Let's throw some lighting movement with moving fixtures to kind of, you know, add to the dynamics of a song. Um, that's simply put what the creative design objective is. I want to make this important note too, that adequate lighting design is crucial for your church's live stream. Cameras need light. Even the most high end of cameras out there, if they don't have light that are reflecting the image, in this case, me is being reflected into this camera right here that you're watching me on. Um, if, if I didn't have my key light on, it's gonna look horrible. Actually, let me demonstrate that to you. How would you feel if for the rest of this training, I kept my lighting like this? Maybe you don't wanna see my wonderful face as clearly as you did a few moments ago, uh, but it's it's distracting. It's it's just it doesn't really capture your attention as well. You just don't see me uh, communicating quite as clearly. So a lot of churches, their lighting design looks like this, and this is why their live stream looks horrible. So before you go spending a ton of money on expensive cameras and lenses and live stream gear, 
please, please, please make sure you have adequate lighting um, in that you've, you've configured your lights in a way and your cameras in such a way that they're actually going to be working together. The camera side of things, we definitely cover a ton of in our live streaming courses. So use this course in conjunction with our live streaming courses that are gonna talk more about camera exposure and things like that. So let's get, let's get some good lighting back here. Much, much better. And I want to illustrate for you a case study of a church uh, that I go to. This is Grace Church. I started going here within the past year when I moved to Florida. It's an awesome church. I love it there. And they have really a great foundation of all the gear that you need in a modern worship context. And they have a really great lighting system, like whoever designed this lighting system, the integrator who they hired, uh, they built this church about a year ago they knew these fundamental concepts of what fixtures they would need and, and where where to place the fixtures but there was an issue there was some sort of gap in terms of just getting the actual worship team and tech tech team um, up to speed on the best practices of how to use those fixtures properly um, so you can see a before and after here we did not change anything about the fixtures or the control software um, in this setup. Like the same same fixtures were, were hung before and after. All we did is we actually just re-aimed fixtures and we controlled the beam of our lighting fixtures more effectively. Um, and then we did just some brightness adjustments at the control software. I think a lot of churches watching this course could be in a similar place to Grace Church where you're gonna learn about the concepts of great lighting and you're gonna realize oh, we actually do have all the fixtures we need. Um, maybe some of them are kicking around in a closet somewhere. We need to hang them still. But maybe you don't need to hang any new fixtures. You just need to aim them and control them properly to get better results. So before, you can see here that, you know, if you just compare the images, you can see our worship leader here, Asa. He looks darker. His skin tones look a little weird. Um, and there's just not much dynamics to this image. Like the, the brights aren't very bright, the darks aren't very dark, it's kind of flat, um, and th there's not much color in the background at all. It's kind of green, but not really. And a lot of churches will kind of settle for this because if this, what you see on the left, is, is all you know and what you're used to, you, you kind of don't think any different, like it could, could be much better. But I knew when I got there, I'm like, man, this lighting needs to improve because it looked pretty much just as bad in person as it did online. Um, actually, probably looked worse online. And there's some some weeks during the live stream, like you just could not see basically anything that was going on. Again, combination of camera exposure and poor lighting. But poor lighting is where it starts. And that's what the problem was. So what we did is we just again we re-aimed the lights we controlled the shutter on the uh, front lighting that they had and we made some adjustments to the brightness and now just look how much better the subject stands out and you can see asa as he's leading worship much clearly in the background we have much more color control so we can actually light up these panels in the background and you can see kind of that back kind of wash atmospheric effect happening with the lighting in there. So it just looks much clearer. And here's an example of what this change looked like for our preaching portion of service. This is our pastor, Aaron. And before, you know, during the sermon, they would, you know, put the lights on full brightness. So he's, he's actually bright enough as a subject. But what was happening, because the lights were aimed improperly, it, they were flooding onto the back wall. And that's why the back wall looks flat. You can just see random light beams kind of flooding onto that back wall. We, we don't want it to be like that. We want to be able to control that back wall. We want it to be black when there's no light. We want it to be uh, a color when we have different colors. So here you can see we've got this similar blue look. It's kind of my favorite color for worship is, is blue. Um, maybe because it's just my favorite color overall. But we have this blue look and now there's much just better separation between Pastor Aaron and the background. So again, these were changes that we implemented without introducing any new fixtures. It was, it was all just about getting the, the aim of the fixtures right and the control right. Here is the four step process to professional lighting design for churches. If you can follow these four steps and apply them to your context, you are going to get much better results when it comes to lighting. So what I'm gonna do is first I'll introduce the step and then I'm actually going to um, illustrate it to you um, in our worship center at South Fellowship Church. Step number one, the front wash light. This is very important to achieving that first objective we talked about earlier of illuminating subjects 
properly. Your worship leader, your pastor, whoever it is, they are leading at a moment in time in worship. And for them to communicate effectively, people need to see them. So that's where the front wash light comes in. That's kind of the first half of meeting that objective of adequately lighting your subject. Right now, I'm sitting at my desk and I have one front wash light right in front of me. It's a nice, soft uh, key light and that's what's illuminating. And I, I showed you guys earlier on what that looks like when that's turned off. So that's my front wash light here. Now let's head on over to our worship center at South Fellowship and I'll illustrate this to you there. Welcome to the South Fellowship Church Worship Center in which I'm going to demo for you some of these principles that we're talking about. First, let's talk about front lighting. So you can see I'm standing here on the front little platform we have on our stage. And I know every single stage out there is unique, but most of these principles will always apply to any church context. First, I'm gonna go ahead and turn off our front lights. So now there's pretty much no light in the room except for the light coming off of the uh, projection that I have behind me. So we have four primary front wash fixtures in front of me. I'll go ahead and turn those on. This is pretty much at full brightness. So you can see these lights. Uh, basically, you've got one, two, three, four. So if I'm looking straight ahead out to the congregation, um, we've got the two lights on the right side of me. They are about a 45 degree angle up. And that's one important tip I also want to share with you when it comes to not having weird shadows on your subject with front lighting is try to have your lights for whatever subject you're trying to light 45 uh, degrees vertically. And then also 45 degrees to the side works well, especially if you can have two front lights lighting one zone kind of coming together in one place. We don't really have as many front light fixtures that I would prefer in this space, um, but this works pretty well because whoever's standing on this front platform here is gonna get a pretty even wash uh, no matter what part of the platform that they are on. So you can see here as I kind of shuffle back and forth across the frame. Sometimes with front lights, you can get a more dramatic look when you only have one of them lit. So I have this primary key light right here that's lighting one side of me and it has some pretty harsh shadows on the other side and it makes it a bit more dramatic. So that can be appropriate sometimes, especially for maybe a worship leader if you want the song to look and feel a little bit more dramatic. Um, but usually when we're doing you know, our teaching uh, lighting design for our, our pastors, we're just gonna have those full front lights on so that there's a nice uh, even wash all across uh, the subjects who are on stage. Step number two is to implement a kick light or a hair light, or sometimes it's called a kicker light. Uh, the, any of these terms are pretty much referring to the same thing. The purpose of a kick light and a hair light is to enhance the look of the subject on stage you're trying to light, like a pastor or a worship leader, anybody else who's talking during worship by separating them from their background. So that's what the kick and the hair light does. So we've got my front light and then a kick light or a hair light is gonna be above the subject and a little bit behind, like not too far behind. Um, so in this scenario here, my kick light is this little LED panel that's right above me. My hand is pretty much on it right here. It's probably like a foot or so above my head, out of frame so you can't see it. And you can see how it's it's it kind of has this orange glow around my hat. And here I can kind of adjust the brightness so it, it's too much if I do that, right? I actually have it on pretty dim. I just want it to be uh, glowing a little bit. And then you can kind of see, again, the difference. Let me shut it off. So that's no hair light. Notice how um, kind of flat the image looks and I kind of get absorbed into the background behind me, right? And then when I turn it on, it kind of helps separate me. So you get the hair on my shoulders and, and on top of my head, and that's separating me from the background. And it's, it's subtle. It's one of those things where like, you kind of almost don't notice at all um, until I demo that to you right there and you see it before and after. And it's like, whoa, that's a huge difference. I would never want to be without a kick light or a hair light. So let's head on to the worship center and I'll demo that uh, for you there. So here's what it looks like with our hair light or our kick lights on at South Fellowship. Let me go ahead and I will turn off the front lights. And now I'm gonna only turn on the back hair light. So now you can see 
there's sort of a glow around the top of my head and my shoulders here, and it, it's creating that separation between me and the background. And here is what that hair light looks like um, from this side angle here, so you can kind of get a, a better picture of where this light is placed. Notice it's not necessarily a 45 degree angle behind me, it doesn't need to be. It can be you know, above me and a little bit behind me. I think it's around like 16 to 20 degrees or, degrees or something like that. Um, so it's not as far back uh, when you're having the, the kick lights. And again, it's gonna create that nice uh, kind of silhouette look. It's gonna separate me from the background. So now I'm gonna combine the front lights with the hair light behind me. And here's what it looks like when I shut off the hair light. You can see it just kind of like loses that separation of, uh, from on the back of me. And then I turn the hair light back on and then that kind of comes back a little bit here. We don't always have the hair light on 100% full, sometimes around 60 to 70%. And then let's go back to the front angle here so you can kind of see the combined results of these uh, two lighting fixtures working together. So let's go ahead and turn off the hair light. So no hair light and now bringing the hair light back on. So that's the hair light or the kick light demoed in this space. We also have some colored kick lights or hair lights. So if I go ahead and I turn on behind me here, there's a kind of blue, you can see the blue cyan colors behind me. And let me just turn down my front lights just so you can get a better uh, look at what that looks like here. So this kick light look, if you use some blues or purples in combination with those front lights, it can look really sharp, I think, especially for a worship leader setting. I think for like teaching pastors, uh, I usually like to have a more, you know, kind of incandescent, warmer look to that kick light. That's why we use our regular fixtures for that. But we do have the blue look here. And then let me go ahead and bring in our front lights. And that's a pretty pleasing look to have the natural front light uh, lighting the front of me and then having the, the blue kick light that again, it's creating that separation between me and the background. Step number three, which is very easy to implement in most churches is a wall wash. So whatever platform or stage you have at your church, you most likely have some walls at the back of that space or that stage. And one of the easiest ways to have some, some color lighting design on your stage is to simply wash color light onto the wall behind your band. I've done this in many church contexts. And now I'm gonna turn on my LED light that I have here in my studio and you'll kind of get a sense of what I'm talking about. So this is an LED light tube. I like to use it for YouTube videos and stuff like that. It's a Nanlite Pavo Tube 30C. I think they do make DMX enabled ones. Um, if you ever wanted to integrate that into a DMX uh, lighting system for your church, I, I would love to get a ton of these sometimes. But in terms of this concept here of a wall wash, it, to illustrate this for you, I'll just put it behind me and I'll have it kind of pointing at the wall behind me because I don't really want it in front of me because I'm gonna look blue, kind of like a Smurf. That doesn't look good, right? So watch this. Now that light is behind me, it's directed more at the wall. You can kind of see some of it also uh, reflecting on me a little bit. That light doesn't give me much control over that, that beam of light. It kind of just like washes everywhere. But you get the idea, that's a wall wash. And for a lot of church stage setups and platforms, you probably have some bare walls behind your band um, or you know just behind the pulpit or wherever it is that if you threw light onto those walls, it's gonna add some nice color and start adding some nice effects. So now let's head on into the worship center and I'll demonstrate to you what this looks like in our setup. So we're back here at South Fellowship Church and I wanna show you our wall wash fixture I'm just going to pan over here and you can kind of get a feel for it. This panel right here, uh, the stage is a little bit of mess there in the midweek here, but we have these wooden panels behind us and I'll cut in some other footage um, from other events that we've had here where you can see sometimes we actually don't have the screen behind me. We turn the screen around and we have paneling and we have lights that are shining down on those panels. That is our wall wash here at South Fellowship. And really depending on the week or the sermon series or the style we're going for on our stage design, uh, it can be different in how much wall wash we're using. And I do think a projector like what we're using right now on a, on a white reflective service, surface can function as a wall wash. There's some churches that use kind of environmental projection and that's basically what that is, is a, a wall wash. It's adding lots of color behind me. And I have a few different presets so I can change it to different colors like red. And then we've got um, amber and we've got purple. 
And we also have some movement in some of these scenes too. So you'll actually see uh, these lights kind of fading in and out behind me. You can kind of see them on the top of the screen because it kind of washes onto the top of the screen um, as well. And that adds a cool kind of visual dynamic all with a simple wall wash. Step number four is when you start adding in atmospheric effect lighting. This is when you start working with lighting fixtures like moving lights that have gobos and cool beams. And of course, you're gonna need a hazer that creates that atmospheric effect that you can see the beams of light. Uh, there's blinder fixtures, there's uh, lasers, there's all sorts of fancy lights that you can get into when it comes to the atmospheric lights. And this should always be step number four. There's a reason why I ordered these steps in the way that I did, because you gotta have number one, good front lighting, number two, a kick light, number three, that's when you can start doing some um, wall uh, washes, and then step number four, that's when you should worry about moving fixtures and such. Don't get this out of order. Don't go building a lighting system and thinking, oh, I need to buy a bunch of moving lights with gobos. Like, no, don't do that. Prioritize. Uh, in the exact order that I laid them out for you here. So now let's head back on over to South Fellowship Church and talk about some of the atmospheric lighting effects that we have set up there. So here is our simple use of atmospheric lighting effects here at South Fellowship. I would consider our atmospheric lights here to be our Edison bulbs. So if I turn on these light bulbs, you kind of see them all around the back of me on stage here. We don't run any haze. We don't have any fancy moving lights, uh, but these Edison bulbs function as atmospheric effect lighting. You could also get like tube light fixtures like the kind I have in my studio. Um, you can, again, you can get movers. Um, you can get profile lights, you can get LED wash movers, you can get the ones that have gobos built into it, you can get blinders, there's all sorts of different atmospheric lights out there, and this is our simple implementation of it, where we made these Edison uh, light stands and we're hanging Edison light bulbs from the ceiling, and it just has a really nice homey, cozy, glow to the stage that fits the vibe of our church. So those are the four steps to professional lighting design. Have adequate front wash lights, have an adequate kick light, have wall wash, and then have your atmospheric effects. Put those last. Don't put atmospheric effects before one, two, or three. A word about style. All churches are unique. There's so many different styles of worship out there and denominations. You get traditional, contemporary, modern, cafe style churches, just all sorts of different styles, right? All churches, regardless of your tradition, denomination, should observe steps one and two, uh, the front and kick lighting, so that people are visible and your live stream is going to look good. I know sometimes I've hear from people uh, who are like, Jake, I'm at a, a Roman Catholic church or I'm at a Lutheran church and we have a traditional building and we don't really wanna do like crazy modern lighting. And that's okay. You can still observe these principles from steps one and two when you have adequate front lights and kick lights and you don't have to have any wall washes or any atmospheric effects. And that, that can work well for a traditional church. But you might also wanna explore some different scenarios. Even if you're a traditional church, you could implement some wall washes. And I've seen that before. There's an Anglican church in town. If you look at Wellspring Anglican Church, look them up on YouTube. We've done tech tours with them where they had wall washes and they would change the colors of those wall washes depending on the season of the liturgical calendar. So there's actually probably a lot of creative things you could do with lighting if you ever went down that route, even if you're in a more traditional church. Steps three and four that we covered in this four-step process, that will look different in every church setting. It has a lot to do with your mission, your style, your values, your budget, how many of these fancy lights do you wanna get? So I'm not going to prescribe and say like every single church has to implement these fancy things like a hazer machine and moving lights. That, that would be foolish. It just doesn't make sense because those are artistic, creative choices that have to be contextualized to your local church context. And before we move on in this course, I do want to spend some time just talking about what is light, just the concept of light. Hopefully now you have lots of clarity on that four-step process and how to design a great system, but let's just talk about the nature of light. So light is a pretty magnificent thing that God created, right? And that's what the very first thing he created was 
light. So it's kind of a big deal and it's it's a part of our lives in, in a lot of different ways. So light exists on the electromagnetic spectrum and maybe this is gonna uh, bring back some good memories or bad memories from your high school physics uh, courses back in the day. Um, but visible light is, is just a small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, right? On the far left, you got like radio waves and on the far right, you've got gamma rays. Um, and in the between, this is the visible light that's pretty safe. And this is the light that we can, you know, see and, and perceive the world around us. And then you have red on the left, which has the, the longer wavelengths. And then you have like the violet, which has the shorter wavelengths. None of this is super important or relevant to church lighting design, but just wanted to bring bring you back to some of these fundamental principles about light is that it, it basically it consists of a ton of different wavelengths of um, electromagnetic particles and waves, right? Light is both a particle and a wave. I do remember that back from physics. So that's the first thing to understand about visible light, which was what we are working with. CRI is an, another important concept to understand when it comes to light, because a lot of the lighting fixtures that you're gonna purchase might have a CRI uh, number assigned to them. That's a color rendering index. And the short answer to what this all means is basically, if you go with a light that's, that's cheap and inexpensive, it's gonna have a low CRI, and you're gonna get very poor results. Cheap lights are gonna look bad, and better lights, they don't always have to be super expensive, but probably somewhere in the high hundreds to $1,000 or so per fixture, those are going to have a higher CRI with um, a rating of 100. 100 is the same type of light quality we get from the sun. The sun is emitting all of the different uh, wave forms that we talked about earlier on this previous slide, pretty much all the red through the purple at the same amount uh, or mostly the same amount uh, in such a way that when the sunlight hits an object like an apple, we we see that the apple's color um, in, in the most full way. It's fully saturated um, and the apple looks great. But if you get cheap little RGBW par can light from, you know, Alibaba or something like that, and you light the apple, that little LED par can, because it's so cheap, it's not producing all of the same wavelengths that you get from the sun. So, you know, when you're looking at the apple, you're actually seeing the light that's being reflected off the apple to your eye, right? And if there's not a good light source that's illuminating that apple, um, then you're just not gonna see actually all of the color that that apple has. So that's why, you know, cheap light has, has a poor CRI, it's gonna be in 70 and it's gonna look weird. It kinda has this weird like purplish tint and that, that's the same exact um, results that I've seen in some of the, you know, cheap LED lights that I've tried to implement at churches before in the past. And I've always wondered, why do they look so horrible? Why do the people kinda look purple on stage? It has to do with CRI. So here's an example of what a CRI test looks like on a light. It's basically divided up into these like 15 R zones or measurements. The higher that these measurements are, closer to 100, um, just the more accurate the, the color is going to look of the object that's being illuminated by this light. So the important thing is to know, when it comes to CRI, look for things that are at least like 90 and above. If it's below 90, especially for like your front wash lights, when you're illuminating uh, people's skin tones and you want them to look natural, don't go cheap with inexpensive low CRI lights. Another concept I want to make you familiar with is color temperature. So this one's pretty straightforward. Even if you're not a tech geek, it's, it's pretty easy to see and understand what's going on. So color temperature is, is the way of um, basically rating the the temperature of that light. Is it going to be a cooler temperature? Is it going to be a warmer temperature? So it's rated in Kelvins. So that's what K stands for. And on the left side of the chart here, you'll see 1500 Kelvin is about the equivalent of candlelight, which is about as warm as a light can possibly get. On the right side, you have daylight to ultra daylight. So this is where it starts to get blue or have a very cool feel to it. Color temperature is gonna be important for the front lighting that you have at your church. And the sweet spot you're gonna be looking for uh, color temperature wise for those front lights is gonna be somewhere around here, 4,000. Sometimes I have 
I really prefer like daylight front lights closer to like 5,000, but in a venue like a church where you have a stage and you also want people to kind of look good, you know, in person, it's not just about what you're producing for camera like I am here. Um, I think the 4,000 to 4,500 range is going to be ideal for color temperature. Because let me show you what happens when I dramatically change the color temperature of this key light. Currently, this color temperature of this light is actually like 5,600. Now I drop the color temperature of this light down to 3,000. And my camera is not on auto white balance. It probably would have adjusted it automatically. I have it locked into 5,600 Kelvin because that's what I had, had it at before. And you can just see how yellow and warm I look in this image. So you, you definitely don't want to go too warm because it just looks too warm. It, it just, I, I kind of look orange. And here we are back to 5600 Kelvin from my studio key light. Now let's talk about ambient light. So ambient light is the light coming from other sources. And in a church setting, it's most commonly the windows that you have within your worship center. That can become an issue sometimes, especially if you're trying to have more of the wall washes and the atmospheric lighting uh, effects that have color. And the problem is if you have a ton of ambient light coming in the room, those lights aren't gonna do a whole lot because all the ambient light is washing out everything. I think if you're in a more traditional church with big stained glass windows and you have lots of ambient light, that's fine. It, you'll just add light to the front light and maybe a kick light so that your subjects, subjects can be seen more clearly. And generally, you're going to be lighting them a decent amount brighter than any ambient light coming in the room. But if you're in a more modern church setting and you, you want to have more control over the color wall washes or atmospheric washes and effects and have a hazer, that's when you're gonna have to work on some sort of ambient light control situation. Because if you don't, then all that ambient light is gonna wash out all the color and effects and you won't even know that they're there. My favorite solution to this is using something like a solar shade. So you can contact local line supply or shade companies in your area. Usually they have options for solar shades. I like solar shades because they're black, they kind of are pretty minimalistic, especially if you roll them all the way up, you just barely can tell they're even there. And then when they're down, you have different options of having 1% uh, open shades, the five to 10%. To um, so, you know, you could probably get away with anywhere from, I'd say five to one is what I would prefer. We have 1% in our studio here. So we have big windows over here, but you wouldn't be able to tell because the shades are only letting in 1% of that ambient light, but then I can still see outside. Um, so I really like that because you still get the view of a window. Obviously it's a different type of view because you're looking through that, that shade or that screen. Um, but in a lot of churches, that could mean a lot because I was in a church one time that has some beautiful stained glass windows. They let in a lot of light. So we put some nice, you know, sleek solar, solar shades um, at the top of the, the windows. And then, you know, before our modern contemporary service, we'd put the shades down and we just did manual shades because it took about 30 seconds to do. And then that really controlled a lot of the amount of ambient light coming in. But then as a congregant, you could still enjoy the, the beautiful design of the stained glass because it was still coming through at 1% through that shade. So solar shades, I love them. I'm always a big advocate for those, especially for churches, if you want to still see out the windows and have the feel that you have windows. I've seen motorized curtains at churches. I've seen motorized garage doors. There's all sorts of solutions out there, but just be mindful of ambient light in whatever church situation you find yourself. Finally, I wanna talk about the most common mistakes to avoid when it comes to lighting in a church setting. Um, here they are, not enough front light or key light, so people just aren't being lit adequately enough. Um, having no back or kick or kicker light at all. Um, having no hair light, so the image just looks really flat and the subjects are not standing out from the background. Not having beam control. Um, basically, these first three problems are so common, and these are the exact ones that I showed you back at Grace Church. So you have a bunch of uh, maybe front lights, but they're just washing over the entire stage. They were never aimed intentionally anywhere. You don't have barn doors or shutters on those fixtures, so the light just goes everywhere. Um, and then complex lighting control. This is another very common thing where someone at some time purchased a big fancy theatrical lighting console for your church. It's completely overkill. Nobody knows how to run it. It's really frustrating and just makes you want to pull your hair out. And you just hope that nothing breaks and you cross your fingers. So uh, we're going to be talking about simplifying your lighting control with LightKey later on in the course. 
And then finally, another very common mistake is using inexpensive, low CRI fixtures, which we talked about earlier, of trying to save a buck, you get cheap fixtures, and then everybody just looks, they look sickly, it looks purple, or just looks very strange, especially on camera. So these are the common mistakes to avoid. If you avoid these, your lighting is gonna look amazing uh, by, by just avoiding these common mistakes. So that concludes this lesson on lighting theory and best practices. Please, please implement the four steps I talked about earlier in order and keep these steps in mind as we go about thinking about the anatomy of a lighting system, as you design your system, and then you actually start working in your control software. Come back to these, rewatch the lesson if you need to, because you are going to be using these in whichever church lighting context you find yourself. And that concludes this lesson. Thanks so much for watching this video. If you want more in-depth lessons on implementing the best gear and software in your ministry, check out worshipministryschool.com. Not only do we have a comprehensive course library on all of the subjects when it comes to audio, visuals, lighting, automation, and broadcast, but you can also get one-to-one -one coaching from one of our team members. And there's even an option where we can come to your church to help you optimize these things in person within just a few days. So go to worshipministryschool.com, apply to join our program, and we'll talk soon. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.